The float property is most commonly used for page layout. However, the original purpose of float was to allow text to wrap around an object, something commonly seen in print design. As float is often not used as originally intended, working with it can be a bit fragile and a bit tricky until you get used to its quirks. We'll look first at the intended use of float, and then look at creating two and three column layouts, and finish up by looking at how to deal with some of the tricky parts of floats, clearing them properly and dealing with container collapse. Let's look first at the intended use. The float property accepts three values, left, right, or none. If we take an image and a couple of paragraphs of text and float the image to the left, we see the intended use of the float property on the web. We can move the image to the opposite side by setting float right, or remove it completely with float none, which is the default. We can take this idea further and float two blocks of content side by side to achieve a two column layout. Here, a main content container is given a width of 60% and floated to the left. And its leftmost edge aligns to the leftmost edge of its parent. A sidebar is given a width of 30% and floated to the right. There's a gap of 10% between them, which provides some breathing room. So how can we make a three column layout? Well, when a series of boxes are all floated in one direction, they align next to each other. This is because a floated element will align its left-hand side with the leftmost edge of its parent or the nearest floated element. If all three boxes have a width of 33.33% and we're using box sizing border box, we get an equal three column layout. For more info on box sizing, check out episode two on the CSS box model. We could achieve the same three columns by floating all the boxes to the right instead. But in this case, the first box aligns its rightmost edge with the right edge of the container, and the next box floats as far as it can go to the right, and so on. The result here is the same three columns, but with the content order reversed, which can come in handy when dealing with source order in responsive design. Another property that goes hand in hand with float is clear. When elements float, they cause any adjacent element to try and flow around them, which can cause layouts to look a bit weird sometimes. A classic example is a footer beneath two floated columns. Let's take the two column layout from before and add some dimensions and some background colors so we can see what's going on. If we now add a footer beneath the columns, we get a slightly strange behavior. This is because the footer is trying to flow around the two floated columns instead of just starting beneath them. We can fix this by adding the clear property to the footer, which clears the effect of the floats on either side of setting it to both. Other available values are the same as float, left, right, or none. Floats can cause another layout problem, which can sometimes be difficult to see. Here I have a section with three floated elements inside of it. The section has a pink background, but that doesn't appear to be visible. If we inspect element on this section, we see that its height is zero. As the section only contains floated elements, it's unable to automatically calculate the height it needs to contain the boxes. We could remedy this by adding a fourth element and setting the clear property on it. But this is a bit clunky and adding an empty element that has a purely visual purpose is not good practice for writing clean markup. Another option is to create a new block formatting context for the section, which will contain all the floats within it. The float, position, display and overflow properties can all be used to create a new block formatting context when using certain values. But the most commonly used one that prevents container collapse is overflow hidden. If we remove the clearing div and set overflow hidden on the section, the container collapse is fixed and the whole thing feels a lot less hacky. Hiding the overflow of an element is not always possible though, and content that's intentionally overlapping or outside the boundaries of the box will be hidden. A more robust way to deal with container collapse 
is to use a pseudo element to do the clearing for us. We'll be tackling pseudo elements as the main topic in episode 16, but here's a handy snippet for fixing container collapse in the meantime. By adding this snippet to your CSS and adding the class of clearfix to the element you want to prevent collapse on, the invisible after pseudo element does the job of our clearing div from the earlier example. Now we solve the container collapse problem, don't run into any issues of hidden overflow, and keep the markup as lean as possible, which is a win-win.